Hello, this is Gary LaRue, Technical Editor at Microwave Journal. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar discussing the impact of final plated finishes on insertion loss for high-frequency printed circuit boards. The webinar will be given by John Coonrod of Rogers and Brian Rowdio of Sonnet Software. Before we begin the presentation, let me cover a few items about the ON24 webinar platform. In the center of your screen, you'll see a window containing the presentation. You may enlarge this to full screen to have a better view of the slides. The window on your screen labeled Resource List contains a copy of the presentation, which you may download at any time. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay within about an hour after we finish, allowing you to watch it again and recommend it to colleagues who weren't able to join the live event. You'll find a link to the recording in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. After the presentation, we'll have time for John and Brian to answer your questions. If you'd like to ask one, just type it in the Q&A box on your screen. And if you have any technical problems, please click on the yellow box with a question mark at the bottom of your screen, which will take you to a user's guide. You can also submit a question in the Q&A box, and we will try to assist you. Now let me introduce our speakers. John Coonrod is a Technical Marketing Manager for the Advanced Connectivity Solutions Division at Rogers Corporation. He has been involved with the printed circuit board industry for 30 years. About half this time he spent with flexible printed circuit boards doing circuit design, applications, processing, and materials engineering. For the past 15 years, John has been working with high-frequency circuit materials, including circuit fabrication, application support, and electrical characterization. John chairs the IPC D24C High Frequency Test Methods Task Group. He received a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Arizona State University. Brian Rowdio, our other speaker, is the VP of Operations at Sonnet Software. He received his bachelor's in electrical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Syracuse University. His algorithm research at Syracuse helped him win the All-University Doctoral Prize. Brian is a member of IEEE and serves as a reviewer for the Microwave Theory and Technique Society transactions. His volunteer contributions also include the 2012 IMS Steering Committee and the MTT Administrative Committee. Gentlemen, I'll turn the screen over to you and look forward to the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to be talking about the impact of final plated finishes on insertion loss for high frequency printed circuit boards. The agenda is shown here. I'm going to be talking through the first three bullets. And then after that, uh, Dr. Brian Radio will look at the next three. So, what I'm going to be going through is the overview of insertion loss. After that, some final plate of finish impacts and things to consider for microscope and ground coupling or waveguide, and then illustration and uh, some discussion about some data that we've collected in a pretty large study a few years ago. After that, uh, Brian will look at and discuss the uh, description of the basic plate of finish in Sonnet, introduction to Sonnet Lab, the uh, Sonnet MATLAB scripting interface, and also demonstrating uh, how to apply plate of finish to the circuit in Sonnet Lab. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go through a quick overview of insertion loss, and more than likely, most people that are listening now are probably pretty familiar with this, but I, I just want to do it to make sure that we're all using the same uh, same vocabulary and things like that, thinking the same thing. Uh, so basically, the plated finish has an impact on insertion loss really because it normally has an impact on conductor loss, which is a component of insertion loss, and I'll explain that more in just a few slides. Uh, the impact of the final plate of finish actually has several dependencies, and uh, again, we'll talk about each one of these in a little more detail, but there is a circuit thickness dependency, frequency dependency, the type of the plated finish that is used, and then also the circuit design itself can make a difference. So for a quick overview of insertion loss, insertion loss is made up of four different components. There's uh, conductor loss, dielectric loss, radiation loss, and leakage loss that all add up to be the total insertion loss. And uh, today we're mostly going to be talking about conductor losses. 
and some about dielectric losses. I'm not going to speak much about radiation loss today. Uh, in some applications, radiation loss can be a very big issue. Uh, for the data that we're going to be sharing today and the design and the frequencies and things like that, radiation loss is really a minimal issue, so I'm not going to really discuss that. Leakage loss is also another issue I'm not going to discuss today, mainly because um, leakage loss is a little unusual. We don't run into that very often, but you can. There are certain applications, like very high power applications, we run into that occasionally. But for what we're doing today, data collected at very low power, things like that, it really doesn't make sense. So I'm really going to focus more on conductor loss and dielectric losses that make up the total insertion loss. So conductor losses, uh, there's several influences for that, and one of them is skin depth. And as I'm sure most people are aware, as you get the higher frequency, you have a thinner skin depth, and essentially the RF current is using less of the conductor. And using less of the conductor means you have more losses due to the conductor, more conductor losses. So I've given a very simple formula here, more uh, just as a relationship to think about things. So higher frequency, obviously, is going to mean lower skin depth, thinner skin depth. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about real quick was uh, sigma, conductivity. And uh, a lot of these plated finishes, as you'll see, are not as conductive as copper. So the conductivity can be poorer or lower. And a lower conductivity means a thicker skin depth. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. So now you have a metal that is less conductive that's going to cause more conductive losses. And also the skin depth is going to try to use more of that lossy metal just due to the nature of how skin depth works. Copper surface roughness is another issue that is related to conductor losses, and uh, we have several papers on this. Sonnet has some excellent papers on the same topic. Uh, and more specifically, what I'm talking about, I've given a uh, cross-sectional view of a microstrip transmission line here. I kind of exaggerated the interfaces I'm talking about, and that is the substrate copper interface. That interface is the copper surface roughness that I'm talking about. And that can have an impact on the insertion loss, specifically the conductor loss, and also, it can impact the phase response as well. So I've given a couple of tables of information here just as a reference to uh, help the thought process a little bit. And uh, just an example, table on the left is skin depth and copper. And if you look at an application that's uh, 0.5 gigahertz, 500 megahertz, you can see the skin depth is about 2.95 microns. And if you were using a copper list on the right that is actually a high-profile copper that is often used to get very good peel strength, uh, that's got a copper roughness of about 2.2 in this particular case. So at 500 megahertz, the copper surface roughness of that high-profile copper really isn't having a significant impact on the conductor loss and the phase response. But once you get up to 1 gigahertz, you can see that's different, and even 10 gigahertz with a skin depth of uh, 0.66 using a copper that is rough as 2.2 microns is definitely going to have an impact. And the way I kind of think about that intuitively is you uh, get a thinner and thinner skin depth. Now the RF current is using more of the roughened surface. And uh, also another quick comment here is rolled copper on the uh, chart or the table on the right is usually the smoothest copper we can find in the industry. It typically has an average surface roughness of about 0.3 or actually more data recently suggests it's about 0.35 microns. But that's considered extremely smooth. Uh, here's a chart that I did, and this is a comparison using 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines. The material was 5 mil RO3003 materials, and everything's exactly the same here with the circuits I tested, except for the type of copper that I used. The curve that's the blue curve, that is circuits that were tested using the standard ED copper, copper surface roughness of about 2 microns RMS. And then the gray curve is the exact same material, same design, same everything. Uh, except the gray curve is showing the insertion loss of a circuit using rolled copper and has a surface roughness of about 0.35 microns RMS. And you can see there's a pretty big difference there. So this material is used right now at 77 gigahertz a watt, and that is the ED version, actually. So you can see the difference between the ED version, the blue curve, and the version with the rolled smooth copper gray curve is the difference of about 0.4 dB per centimeter at 77 gigahertz. And that's really a pretty remarkable difference. Uh, but it does show pretty much that the copper surface roughness obviously has a pretty big impact on the insertion loss, which is, again, mostly due to affecting the conductor loss. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how insertion loss is made up of uh, two different components, conductor loss and dielectric losses. As I mentioned earlier, it's actually four components, but we're going to be ignoring radiation loss and leakage losses. Uh, but to begin with, let me start with the chart in the middle since that's got the legend. 
And uh, really what I did was I, I built three different sets of circuits. So all three charts are using the exact same material. And the only difference being is the thickness of the material. They're all 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines. The chart in the middle is uh, using a 10 mil thick RO4350B laminate. And the thick purple curve is the measured insertion loss. And I measured that using a differential length method, which is a very simple method. Basically, you measure the insertion loss of a short circuit, measure the insertion loss of a long circuit, subtract the short from the long, and you get dB per unit length. In this case, dB per inch is what I'm showing, out to about 20 gigahertz. So on the middle chart, <clears throat> the purple curve is the measured data. And then the other curves are a very simple software that we have that's uh, free to download from our website. And it's an impedance software and uh, does impedance modeling and also very simple loss modeling. It's using closed form equations. So I usually tell people it's pretty good uh, as a ballpark tool. And usually tell customers you, you can use this uh, software to kind of get you in the ballpark and understand the design roughly what you want to do. And then once you have that understood, then jump over to a field solver like uh, Sonnet and then get into more of the detail of the design. So anyway, the nice thing about the software, though, is that um, it separates the different losses that made up the total loss, the total loss being the green curve, which matches the measured purple curve pretty close, close enough for the comparison today anyway. And then it shows how much conductive losses and how much dielectric losses are involved in making up the total loss. And in this case, there are more conductor losses, red curve, than there are dielectric losses, blue curve. That's for the 10 mil thick circuit in the middle chart. The chart on the left, again, same design, 50 ohm microstrip transmission line, except using thinner material, 6.6 mil thick. There you can see an increase in insertion loss. And the main reason the insertion loss increased is the red curve increased. And now you have more conductor losses. So the bottom line is a thinner circuit is going to have more conductor losses, or basically a thinner circuit is going to be more sensitive to the conductor effects than a thicker circuit. Thicker circuit is shown on the far right. That chart on the far right, again, 50 ohm microstrip transmission line using the same material, except thicker in this case. In this case, it's 30 mils thick. And now you can see the red curve, the conductor losses, is no longer the dominant factor. It's really the blue curve, which is dielectric losses. And dielectric losses are mostly related to dissipation factor. But basically what this is showing that is a uh, thicker circuit is more affected by the dielectric uh, material, dielectric uh, components and thinner circuits are more affected by the conductor components. So for final plate finishes, uh, it is a metal that is plated onto the copper, and that metal does impact the conductor losses. And as a quick uh, example of a test vehicle, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later on. And what would be good to do is use a test vehicle that is a thin circuit, and it has very smooth copper and low dissipation factor, and really why that is is because what you're trying to do is exaggerate the conductor losses. So whenever you do look at differences in plated finish, you can see these differences a little bit better or a little higher resolution. Again, I'll talk about the test vehicle a little bit later. Uh, the chart shown here is actually insertion loss uh, versus frequency going out to about 25 gigahertz. And what I did was test two different sets of circuits, and they're using the exact same material. It's RO4003C laminate. And what I'm showing here is the difference of copper versus ENIG. ENIG is electric nickel immersion gold. And we know that nickel is a pretty lost component, a uh, pretty high loss uh, metal. It has nickel by itself has a conductivity about a quarter of copper. And that's pure nickel. And actually, it's a nickel alloy used in this case. Anyway, uh, really what the chart, chart is showing is the difference of a thick circuit and a thin circuit. In this case, the thicker circuit, this is all using the same material. They're all 50 ohm microstrip transmission lines. The thicker circuit with bare copper is the blue curve. Thicker circuit with the ENIG finish red curve difference at 25 gigahertz is about 0.25 dB per inch. And then if you do the same comparison between copper and ENIG on a thinner circuit, the 8 mil thick circuit, that's the green curve and that's the purple curve, there you can see there's a bigger difference, about 0.38 dB per inch difference. So it does show that the uh, conductor effects due to ENEG, the more lossy finish, is going to cause more losses um, at the same frequency, same kind of design on a thinner circuit than would a thicker circuit. So thinner circuits are more sensitive to the conductor effects than a thicker circuit. In this case, the conductor effects are the conductivity change due to nickel and electric nickel immersion gold ENEG. So how does uh, plate of finishes impact insertion loss? 
Um, well, most of the plated finishes used in the industry, those metals are usually less conductive than copper. And being less conductive, that's going to cause more conductive losses, so more conductor losses. I've given a table of information here on the right that is uh, really a table of conductivity for the raw metal, the, the metal itself. And um, in this case, uh, copper is pretty much the best for conductivity, even though silver is a little higher. And also, this is just a quick reference because what's used in the printed circuit board industry are usually not pure metals. Like copper is usually not 100%. Even though the copper we use on our laminate and the copper that's plated up at the PCB fabricator, that's pretty dang close. It's usually 99.9% .9 or so. And then the nickel is uh, shown here to be about a quarter of the conductivity of copper. In reality, the nickel that's used in the PCB industry, uh, that's usually not pure nickel. It's usually an alloy of something. And I think the conductivity may be a little worse than that. And also nickel is ferromagnetic, so there could be a magnetic loss associated with nickel. So anyway, uh, these plated finishes increase the conductor losses due to the fact that they are typically more uh, lossy or basically less conductive than copper. And silver could be the exception. Uh, silver is more conductive than copper, but how it's applied in the printed circuit board industry, it's applied in a process called immersion silver. And that's usually very thin, uh, extremely thin. So if you were to get any benefit out of silver, you would have to be at extremely high frequency so the skin depth would use mostly silver. And that's usually not practical, to be honest. But one thing I'll say about silver from the studies I've done is I've never seen silver really cause more losses, but I can't say that I've actually seen a benefit either. Uh, so I've been asked many times, why did these plated finishes cause more losses on a microstrip transmission line? when a microstrip, most of the fields are between the signal plane and the ground plane, and um, the plated finish is not going to have uh, access to that interface. It's really just going to be on the three edges of the top side of the conductor. Well, what it comes down to is if you do some electromagnetic modeling, such as looking at uh, Sonnet software, what you'll find is at the edges of the conductor, where the conductor meets the substrate on left and right edges of the signal conductor, there is higher current density. And that higher current density is sensitive to the plated finish that is applied there. And it's usually an edge effect where um, the edges of the conductor is actually going to cause a little higher conductor losses, more insertion loss. And it's also accumulative. And what I mean by that is if the circuit is short in length, you probably won't see a lot of difference of the plated finish being applied. Uh, but if it's a longer circuit, then you are definitely going to see more insertion loss uh, due to these edge effects to the microstrip circuit. I've given a uh, microsection photo of a true microstrip circuit, and uh, this kind of shows reality. Normally, uh, we think of uh, the signal conductor being a rectangular shape with the uh, sidewall being perpendicular to the, uh, the substrate. In reality, it's usually more trapezoidal, and in this case, I have what I would think is the worst case, kind of an arc shape. And at the edges there where the conductor meets the substrate, you're going to have higher current density. So in this case, have an ENIG there, electrolysis nickel, electrolysis nickel immersion gold, you're going to have uh, definitely a change in the conductivity at that edge there, and that's going to add up to be more insertion loss with the microstrip. We've seen a lot of comparisons uh, with customers sending us in circuits before, saying that their new design has more losses than their previous design, and sometimes that's designing for a higher frequency, and they're transitioning from microstrip to ground to coplanar waveguide. And we found in several studies, and I'll show a little data here, that a ground to coplanar waveguide usually does have more insertion losses compared to a microstrip when you compare bare copper to a plated finish. So again, microstrip on the left is uh, what I already talked about. You have that edge effect on both edges of the signal conductor. Ground to coplanar waveguide on the right, we have a ground plane at the bottom that's a solid ground plane, and on the top copper layer, it's the coplanar layer where you have a ground signal ground. And there are electric fields coupling between the signal conductor and the ground conductors on the top layer. And uh, so in that area, there's higher electric field intensity. And I usually try to think about current density. And in this case, really what you have is four walls, uh, four conductor sidewalls with current density that are affected by this plated finish. So you really have four areas affected by the final plated finish on the ground coplanar waveguide as compared to microstrip, just having two edges affected by the, the loss here plated finish. And the chart shown here is uh, a good example of a comparison. So what I did was use the exact same material. It's RO4003C and actually the same thickness of material as well. It's 8 mils thick. 
and I made microstrip transmission lines and also made ground to coplanar waveguide transmission lines, all 50 ohms. The chart on the left is a comparison for microstrip design, bare copper, red curve, blue curve is ENIG, electrosniffle immersion gold. Out at about 50 gigahertz or so, we see a difference in loss of about 0.5 dB per inch. And then on the ground to coplanar waveguide circuit to the right, the same type of idea, 50 ohms, it's using the same material. The difference between bare copper and ENIG, bare copper red curve, ENIG blue curve, difference about 1.2 dB per inch. So you can see there's a very significant difference in insertion loss when using the same materials, same design, well, same 50 ohm design anyway, except that on the left is microstrip, on the right is ground to coplanar waveguide. So that needs to be considered, the design aspect that is. So let me talk a little bit about a study we did a few years ago with Intone, which is now McDermott. They make uh, a lot of these different funnel plated finishes, uh, the chemistry for it. And what we did was uh, we looked at several test vehicles and we decided to use a 50 ohm microstrip transmission line. At one time we were thinking about using a ground to coplanar waveguide because we know that it's affected more by the funnel plated finish, but there's more circuit fabrication influences with the consistency of a ground to coplanar waveguide than a microstrip. So just to have more consistency from circuit to circuit, we went with a 50 ohm microstrip transmission line. We used the differential length method to, to get the insertion loss. And uh, what we did specifically was use a five mil thick RC Daryl 6002 laminate with rolled copper. And the reasoning behind that is five mils is pretty thin, so the conductor effects are gonna be exaggerated. The rolled copper is very smooth, and uh, smooth copper means that the copper surface roughness is going to be less of an influence. Also, when you're doing circuit-to-circuit -circuit evaluations, there is differences from one circuit to another for the copper surface roughness. So that roughness value does change from one circuit to another. In the case of rolled copper, it's so smooth, though, that change is very minimal. So that's really not an issue. And then we use the RT Deroid 6002 uh, material also because it has very low dissipation factor, 0.0012. And again, that minimizes the dielectric losses and it allows us to exaggerate more of the conductor losses, which is really what we're wanting to see with these different final plated finishes. Uh, the chart shown here is really an output of this study. And the first thing I want to talk about is the light blue curve. That is the circuit that is the reference, basically. That's our reference circuit. That is bare copper circuits. And then I have some other blue curves that I decided just to keep blue because to me, and accuracy of this test method, all, all those three circuits are really behaving the same pretty much. So it's saying that OSP and immersion silver really have no major impact on insertion loss compared to the circuits made with just bare copper. OSP stands for organic solderability preservative. It's considered a temporary type of uh, protectant for the copper. Uh, immersion silver is a permanent type of plated finish and actually used a lot in the industry. So after that, a brown curve is solder mask. I'll talk about that in a second. The green curve is immersion tin. That plated finish I've been seeing used more and more at millimeter wave frequencies, specifically 77 gigahertz. After that is uh, any pig and then ENIG. And with all the studies I've done on this topic, usually ENIG is the lossier finish. And I know it sounds like I'm kind of bashing ENIG, but in reality, it is a very good finish for how it's used. It's just the designers need to account for the differences in losses when you're looking at bare copper versus ENIG. And that's the, the beauty of using the Sonnet software is they do have a good routine that can account for these losses very uh, effectively and in a pretty user-friendly way. So back on the solder mask topic, though, the solder mask I threw in there really as uh, something that's a little unusual because solder mask does not impact the conductor loss. It's really affecting the dielectric losses. But I put that in there just for designers to have a comparison between uh, ENIG and immersion tin and solder mask, things like that. But this is probably a best case scenario for the solder mask because solder mask is pretty high in moisture absorption. And I tested this in Arizona, which is pretty dry. So more than likely that circuit was pretty dry. And if I tested this again in a high humid, uh, humid environment, what you'd find is an assertion loss would probably increase a pretty good amount because solder mask will absorb a fair amount of uh, moisture just from the air. Also, there is a thickness variation of solder mask. Thicker means more losses, thinner, less losses. So the solder mask curve really should just be looked at as uh, kind of a general trend. And um, I think that's about all I have. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Brian Radio, and he can talk about the sauna software. Uh, thanks, John. I think that was a really great overview of uh, measurements and, and the effect of plating. 
Um, I just want to back up for a little bit and mention that uh, at Sonnet, uh, we've been around for 30 years now, and our primary focus throughout those 30 years has always been accuracy. And there's two components to that. On the one hand, we want to do everything that we can numerically. We want to solve Maxwell's equations with every single bit of precision that modern computers allow, and we take every measure that we can to do that. The other component of that is that we want to be able to model physical phenomena that are going on um, as they relate. And in this case, um, this is something that we really value our collaboration with Rogers for. Um, because they're going to be at the forefront of these sort of phenomena, and they're going to be able to have the physical measurements that are necessary to keep track of them. So when we collaborate with them, we can do two things for accuracy. We can have that numerical precision that we're known for, and we can figure out how to best put these things in the software so that we can get good data that matches with measurements. And so that's what I want to talk about today, is how we can do that for plated finishes. So, uh, to model ENIG and Sonnet, um, there's a number of ways that you can do this. There's a number of ways you can do it with any simulator. What we want to do is find the best way to do that so we can have a lot of accuracy while still maintaining efficiency. So, in general, we're going to want to make the best approximation of the physical structure that we can within simulation. Uh, IPC 450 or 4552 uh, is a standard that you can pull online, and that has a whole bunch of data about uh, how this ENIG process happens, and it gives you some uh, insights into the physical measurements, thicknesses, uh, profiles, things like that. And that's a really valuable resource when you're modeling because you're going to want to be able to get those dimensions and put them into the simulator. The better the data you can put into the simulator, generally speaking, the better data you're going to get out of the simulator. That said, um, while we want to have uh, the most physical model possible, we need to balance that with the practicality of making an EM simulation. So SONNET is a great fit for ENIG plating uh, and other types of plating as well, and that's because we're a 3D planar analysis. So I just want to briefly go over different types of electromagnetic analysis. In general, we'll split them up into surface meshing analyses and volume meshing analyses. Volume meshing is really great in that you can do arbitrary types of geometries. For example, if you wanted to do the radar cross-section of an airplane, that would be really great. Uh, but it also has to discretize in three dimensions, and that can be a little bit tricky, as we'll explain in a second here. A surface meshing tool, we're generally only going to discretize in two dimensions. So in a 2D analysis, that's pretty straightforward. In a 2.5D, we build on that by having multiple layers of 2D. In a 3D planar analysis, which is what SONNET is, we're going to take those uh, layers, interconnect them with vias and thick metals. And that's really, uh, really important to be able to do that because we do have some 3D features in this plating that we need to be able to model. But in general, we'd like to benefit from the efficiency of a surface meshing tool. So that's what makes us a good fit. And this is really important because when we're talking about these uh, platings, they're often very thin and the aspect ratios are often very high. So for the nickel coating, uh, we might see something a thickness of around 6 microns. Uh, and for the gold coating, we might see 0 0.05 microns. Very, very small. Uh, with Sonnet, we still have to discretize in XY, so the sidewall plating is going to affect our discretization. But because we don't have to discretize the dielectrics, we can have very, very thin layers, and that won't affect the analysis time at all. So what does an ENIG model look like uh, for a microstrip circuit? So here we have a, a 3D view of an ENIG uh, plated microstrip in Sonnet. And essentially what we have is a microstrip through line um, made of copper, and that's going to be represented in the green here. That's sitting on a uh, Rogers 4003 substrate, 8 mils thick. And that's going to be plated with a nickel phosphorus plating. Uh, the details of that plating are really important, and I will go over them in a minute. Uh, but for now, the main thing we're going to take away from this is that we have a regular microstrip that's coated on three sides in the cross section with this nickel phosphorus plating. We also want to look at a uh, grounded coplanar waveguide. Uh, so this is a different kind of topology, and it's really important that we can model this effectively as well. And we see some similar things here. Uh, the bottom layer, again, is going to be the dielectric. Uh, we notice that we're not putting any plating on the vias through that. Um, that's because this is a final plated finish. This is something that we would build and then plate afterwards. Because that's not exposed, that wouldn't get the plating on it. Uh, but the exposed surfaces are uh, very important to plate, and that's what we've done here. So in the center conductor, we again see three surfaces. In the ground plates on the side, we see two surfaces. Basically, all of the metal is going to be exposed. We've put that nickel coating on. 
Now, it's really important here to address why we've put coating on the sides. Um, we could save some efficiency if we only use those top surfaces that we see here. So why do we put it on the sides? It turns out it's very important. Uh, to do that, we want to get a physical understanding of what's going on, what electromagnetic effects are happening. Um, conventionally, we might think about that, well, we're adding a higher, a more highly resistive metal to the outside. Uh, in Electric Circuits 101, we all learned that if you've got two resistors in parallel, you actually have less resistance. But here we're seeing more resistance. Uh, and that's because we're not at DC. That's because we really need to understand the electromagnetics that are going in on this. Uh, for that, I like to turn to plotting current distributions. We can see where the current is high, where the current is low, and get a physical understanding of what's going on in the circuit. So here I have 1 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz currents plotted for this microstrip. And we can see that mostly the current's getting pushed to the outsides. Uh, that's edge effect. John talked about this. Um, it's related to skin depth. And basically, the higher the frequency we go, the more current we're going to have in the sides. Um, and so this is actually changing uh, the way that the circuit works. Instead of having most of our current flowing through the lowly resistive copper, uh, we have it flowing through the highly resistive nickel phosphorus. Uh, and we really need to turn to an EM simulator uh, to get those distributions so we can get the appropriate insertion loss here. If we go up to 32 gigahertz, and in this study we go from 1 to 50 gigahertz, very broadband, uh, we're looking at a 3D here view, uh, kind of uh, from the edge, uh, the end of the microstrip line. And again, we can see that the current is concentrated in the sides. And the sides is exactly where we have that lossy, lossy plating. Um, if we were at lower frequency and we had the currents going the center, it wouldn't be a problem. We could just call it copper and move on with our business. But with uh, modern design seeing more high performance, higher frequency, this effect is starting to become a real serious thing. And so we want to model it as best as we can. Um, so again, this is the effect that increases with frequency. Um, at the frequencies we're operating at, 1 to 50, uh, we see the nickel take uh, uh, prominence. If we kept increasing that, eventually we would see the gold plating take prominence, too. Uh, as the gold plating is much thinner than the nickel, uh, for this study we're actually going to um, skip modeling the gold. And I'll address that in a little bit, but it's something that we could model if we had wanted to. Um, so why do we not include the gold? Um, so the gold plating is very, very thin. Uh, it goes on at about uh, 0.05 microns. It's actually kind of a feat of mechanical engineering that we can even make it that thin consistently. Um, so again, we talk about skin depth, and when we have skin depth that's small on the order of our thickness, uh, that's when it really matters. Uh, in this case, um, gold will be about the order uh, of one skin depth when we get to about one terahertz. Um, so if we started to approach terahertz work, I would say that we really want to model the gold. Uh, but since we're in the 0 to 50 gigahertz range, um, for now we're going to leave it out. Um, now when we make assumptions like that, the nice thing about a simulator is it's really easy to verify that. We can try it with, we can try it without, and see if the results change. If they don't change, that suggests that we're okay. So again, by comparison, this nickel, it's about 100 times thicker at 5 microns. Um, and the copper is about 800 times thicker than the gold at 40 microns. So I've, I've got this plotted here. Um, the gold barely even shows up, um, and uh, sometimes it doesn't show up at all depending on how you scale the graph. Um, so to really get a, a physical understanding of the scale of these things, if we take the thickness of our copper and we expand that to the length of a 747 jumbo jet, the gold plating is about the width of a soda can incredibly small. Uh, for that reason, we're going to admit the gold plating from the study. So what data are we looking for? Uh, back on slide 15, uh, John showed some great measurements uh, for ENIG plating. Um, in the red, we have the bare copper for a micro strip and for a grounded coplanar waveguide. And in the blue, this is the same circuit after an ENIG finish has been applied to it. And we can see once we apply that finish, indeed, uh, and this is uh, frequency on the um, x-axis loss in decibels per inch on the y-axis. We can see that once we've applied, uh, applied this finish, um, we get considerably more loss. In the case of uh, high frequency with a grounded coplanar waveguide, it's almost double. Uh, when you're talking about an effect that can double the performance of your circuit, that's an effect you want to model, and generally it's an effect you want to model as well as you can. And so that's what Sans is here for, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, the first thing I want to say before we actually go into the models, though, um, we have lots of good data as far as the thickness of the plating. We have lots of good data on the substrates and the conductivities of the metals that we're using. Um, but there is one um, little bit of guesswork involved, one piece of guesswork involved. 
And that's the conductivity of the nickel phosphorus plating. Um, so we like to sometimes call it nickel. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an alloy with phosphorus. There's lots of different um, kinds of um, methods that they use um, to make this plating. Nickel phosphorus is going to be one of the more common ones. Um, and when I say nickel phosphorus, uh, I want to take a second and mention we're talking about an ally, uh, alloy. We're talking about um, an inhomogeneous mixture of nickel, uh, molecules of nickel, molecules of phosphorus. We're not talking about something like nickel phosphate, which would be molecules of nickel and phosphorus together. We're talking about an alloy. Uh, so because it's an alloy, we have uh, control over how much phosphorus we're going to put in. Um, so, in generally, uh, generally speaking, this is going to be split up into three types of alloy based on phosphorus content, low, mid, and high. Uh, and we see that we have low 2 to 5 percent, high 10 to 13 percent. In general, for circuits, uh, we're probably going to be somewhere in the middle. Um, and this strikes a balance between uh, preventing corrosion and uh, not impacting conductivity too much. And so, if you have, uh, for example, maybe a military application where you need extreme corrosion, uh, prevention, that, that might be a reason to go to a high phosphorus content, or if you have something that's really needs to be conducted, you might go to a low, but in general, we'll see mid, which is going to be balanced. Um, now, unfortunately, the conductivity or resistivity, it's not commonly well defined uh, for this layer. We, we don't necessarily know what it is uh, beyond that higher phosphorus content generally means higher resistivity. Um, if you, uh, you know, I know people can uh, ask questions and comment. If uh, you are aware of a study or you have a study, I'd love to hear about it. Feel free to put that in the comments. Uh, but in general, as a ballpark range, uh, we're going to consider conductivity to be somewhere in the range of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 uh, Siemens per meter, uh, which is going to be significantly worse than copper. Um, and so this is something that when we get to these frequencies where the current distributions are in those sidewalls, we really want to model this effectively. Uh, so what we've done here is we've actually swept the conductivity. Um, this is the nice thing about simulation is you can guess a whole bunch of different things and see how it affects the results. So we know the general range we want to be in. We can essentially just try everything in that range and see what works. Uh, I do want to warn, uh, this can be a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, we don't want to tune our simulation results uh, to match our measurement because we don't necessarily know that the effects we're tuning are the effects that are causing the change in measurement. So it's, it's a very, um, very delicate process, something you want to be careful when doing. Uh, but when you're in a guesswork situation such as this, um, it can be a good way to start. And then once you've got some data, there's other ways you can verify it. And, and I'll say that's one of the reasons that we're looking at both the microstrip and the grounded coplanar waveguide, where they're going to have different field distributions. So we can try the same value and see if it works. So we've swept this, and within the range, it's kind of interesting, actually. We see that the plating has effect from 0 to 10 gigahertz, but it almost doesn't matter what the conductivity is. And then as we go up beyond that, it starts to actually diverge. So this would suggest the higher the frequency you're at, the more important it is to get that uh, conductivity right of this nickel phosphorus content. Okay, so here is our, uh, the model that we showed before, where we've included the uh, NIG, uh, the nickel plating around the copper. And the top two lines, the uh, olive green and the orange, those are going to be measured and simulated for bare copper. And we can see that they're uh, basically intertwined. Um, they're not right on top of each other. There is a little bit of error here, but again, you know, we're in the range of uh, one and a half dB uh, loss in 50 gigahertz. So we're pretty happy with this data. Um, it is worth saying that that's without the plating. Um, so this is the, the accuracy that Sonnet's known for. What's new in this study is that we have data that's both uh, simulated and measured with ENIG finish applied. And that's going to be the silver and forest green on this graph. And we see that those line up well, too. And so this is, this is really exciting. This is a, kind of a, a new process that we can model. Um, and Sonnet took right to it. We just put the data in. Um, we took our guess at conductivity in the range, and we were able to pull out based on, and I believe this is uh, 5e to the uh, 5, uh, or yeah, 5e5 um, for conductivity. We are able to pull some data that looks really good. Uh, I would say it probably doesn't have uh, considerably more error than without the uh, plating on there. Um, now, that's just to say that we've found one place where it agrees, but that's why I mentioned we want to also look at the grounded coplanar waveguide. The field distributions are going to be a lot different. Different parts of the current um, are going to be in different places. Uh, so this is a good way to check to see um, kind of a reality check, certainly not rigorous, but a reality check for that conductivity measurement. So we applied the same exact model um, to a grounded coplanar waveguide where we're just basically covering with this uh, 
5v5 nickel phosphorus metal. And we see very similar results. Again, the top is going to be the bare copper, and the bottom is going to be after the plating has been applied. And there's a little bit of error here, but in general, the models, the curves look similar. Um, we're never more than, I would say, a quarter dB off. Uh, and this is a really broadband sleep that we've got. Again, we're going from um, almost DC up to 50 gigahertz. So this is almost the entire uh, general purpose microwave range that we're looking at. We see good agreement across it. So we're pretty happy with this data. Um, one thing worth mentioning, though, if I go between these two slides, we see that in microstrip, uh, there's maybe 25 to 50% more loss from this plating. When we're talking about the grounded coplanar waveguide, uh, we see almost double the loss. We're seeing a lot more loss from this plating. And we're modeling it effectively, but we're seeing a lot more of it, both in measurement and simulation. Uh, so we wanted to take a second and step back and, and take a look at why that's happening. And this is something that simulators are great for because we can look at the current distribution and we can get that physical intuition as to what's happening in the circuit. So we've looked at the current distribution here. Uh, and in this case, we have the edge effect that we would expect that's increasing with frequency. But also, because we put these, um, excuse me, we put these ground planes right near the circuit, we actually see that in the ground plane as well, we have current that's in the edges that's hanging out in the plating. So more of the current in the whole circuit is in that plating in this, and, and that makes sense. That's why we're getting more loss. Uh, this is another reason why it's very important for us to model these side walls, because if we're just modeling the metal on the top, um, we're not really uh, adequately getting this effect. Um, and so when we do this, uh, we have a, a pretty solid model. Um, it's a good way to handle it. Now, the only problem with this is when we talk about these structures, and you can see on the bottom right here where uh, we've got our, our grounded coplanar waveguide structure. When we, uh, when we draw these in sonnet, that can actually be a little bit time consuming um, because we have to draw the plating on the top, we have to use the sidewalls, we have to make sure the layers are all right, we have to make sure we've used the right connectivity. Um, it's worth doing to be sure, uh, but there should be a better way to do that. Unfortunately, there is. Um, so I'm sure many of you, uh, if not all of you, are familiar with MATLAB, a uh, commercial software package written by the MathWorks Incorporated. Um, and it's a very convenient way to script all kinds of things, particular way, particularly when they're related to math or linear algebra. Um, it's just a way that we can programmatically do things that would be monotonous or tedious or maybe not a good use of our time as engineers. We want to make the computer do as much of the work as it can, and MATLAB is a good means to that end. Uh, so what is SonaLab? So at Sonnet, we're a MathWorks connection program partner. Um, so we have um, you know, a direct line into the MathWorks. Uh, we also have a toolbox called Sonnet Lab that can be installed into MATLAB. And what Sonnet Lab does, um, it's a, a set of object-oriented programs that lets the user fully control Sonnet from within MATLAB. This means that we can script analysis, we can automate analysis, um, we can make the computer do more of the work clicking through the interface. Uh, because it can be all automated. Um, there's lots of really interesting examples. I'll go over one brief one, and then I'll explain how we can use Sonnet Lab to apply metal plating. Uh, Sonnet Lab is available for free on our website, sonnetsoftware.com, um, although a copy of Sonnet and MATLAB are required to use it. Um, so this is a great example. Um, we have a, um, a file on the MATLAB file exchange that you can download today called Sonnet Lab Antenna Example. And what this example does, um, we start out in MATLAB and we create sonnet analyses within MATLAB um, for different types of patch antennas. Uh, now, this is going to randomly uh, generate a patch antenna uh, based on the gridding that you see. It's going to put it into sonnet, simulate it in sonnet, and then pull the results of that simulation back. And so depending on what you tell MATLAB to optimize for, it will use Sonnet Lab uh, and its very extensive optimizers to generate a antenna pattern uh, that best matches what you're looking to do. Now, we're not talking about antennas today, but I think this is a good example of the types of things that you can do with Sonnet Lab. Um, today, we want to do something different. We want to take the, um, the tedious part of applying this plating finish and automate that so we don't have to do it. Um, so now we're going to switch to a live demonstration. I'm going to pull up MATLAB here. Uh, please bear with me for just a moment while we get this set up.
All right, so by now you should be seeing uh, a MATLAB screen. Um, and here we've got a few things up. Uh, first, I'm going to draw attention to the command line. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, just run a quick help command for Sonnet Project. So Sonnet Project uh, is an object-oriented uh, function in MATLAB that allows us to load in um, it's aptly named, it allows us to load in a Sonnet project. So I'm just going to type help Sonnet project. And it's going to pull up a help screen, which gives us some idea of how to use it. Um, I could read this through. And basically what it would tell me is uh, two things. Um, one, how that I can load a project. And two, that I can use this command method Sonnet project to um, view things um, that we can do with this object-oriented command. So we'll look at that in a second. Uh, first, what I want to do is actually load an example. Uh, so in my file browser, we have a few examples here ready to go. Uh, I'm going to call this variable example, and that variable will be the actual Sonnet project. I'm going to run this command, and basically it takes as an input the name of the file. So I'll say load example.son. I do this, it's going to return the object in the uh, command line. Uh, we can see a whole bunch of data. Uh, it's important to note that we can click through this data um, from the workspace. So if I load example over here, then we can see all these different objects in here. Each one of these is going to correspond to a different part of this Sonnet file. Um, so if I click through them, for example, I want to edit the geometry. I can go into geometry. I could scroll through here and say, oh, maybe I've got some variables, parameters, ports, uh, polygons. I can click through, and then I'll find individual polygons. You could edit these directly. You could edit them via the command line. Um, those are both great options, particularly when you become uh, you know, more of an advanced user of Sonnet Lab. Uh, for now, I just kind of want to point out that it's there. The easiest way to manipulate the Sonnet project is just going to be with a method. Um, so I'm going to type methods. Um, sorry. Method Sonnet Project. And so this gives me a list of all the different things that I can do with Sonnet Lab to a project. For example, a simple ones such as save, uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, save as, of course. Change the box size, uh, change the metal types, add metal types, add polygons, all kinds of different things we can do in here. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail in the interest of, uh, of time here, uh, but one thing that I will do is I'll just use one uh, method as an example. I'm going to say open in Sonnet. Uh, so I've taken this project we've loaded into MATLAB. I'm calling the method open in Sonnet. Um, oops. Capitalization matters. Okay, and that's just loaded up Sonnet. Um, and we could view the project from there. Um, so this is all very good. Uh, the main example, the main thing that we want to do today, though, um, is actually to edit the project. And so when I go to, um, let's see, when I go to the different parts of the project here, um, basically what we would do to add the plating is create multiple layers. And then we would uh, go ahead from there. And uh, once we've made these layers, uh, we will add metalization to it, put the plating around it. Uh, that's all a uh, pretty straightforward thing to do, and I've actually written a script called add metal plating. So I'm going to open add metal plating, uh, which is a script I wrote, and just kind of step through it briefly. Um, I'm going to have to uh, uh, speed things up a little bit because we're running out of time here, but uh, with the add metal plating script, we basically load it in, uh, we create this new layer, we create the new metal type. Uh, and then we have the new polygons for that plate. We're doing it all automatically. Um, so I have a um, microstrip uh, filter example. So I can just simply go add metal plating and then microstrip microstrip.son. And it's going to run this script. And we're going to see over here a new Sonnet project is going to pop called microstrip plating. And so microstrip plating has applied over there. This is a file that has the plating attached. Uh, in the interest of bandwidth, um, if I open it up, that's going to change the screen, so we'll just uh, move forward with that. Basically, what that's going to create is going to be um, the models that we've looked at earlier for the microstrip. We could also apply it to a filter um, and things like that. And it's very straightforward and easy to do um, when we're talking about this sort of thing. So it's much easier in general to script things with MATLAB 
and it's going to be um, to do things by hand when they're often re repetitive or tedious or things like that. So when we add the metal plating, I highly recommend checking out Sonnet Lab to do that. Um, we'll make this script available so that you can try it yourself. All right, so we'll go back to the presentation here. Um, we want to make sure we've got some time for questions. So in conclusion, uh, we've discussed six major points. Uh, basic overview of insertion loss, uh, how the final plated finishes impact the insertion loss from microstrip and uh, grounded coplanar weight guide structures. Uh, we've done an illustration and discussion of measured results. We've described a basic plated finish model in Sonnet. We've introduced Sonnet Lab, which is a Sonnet MATLAB scripting interface. Uh, and we've done a demonstration of applying plating to a circuit within Sonnet Lab. All right, so with that, we'd like to move on. We thank you for your attention, uh, and we'd welcome any questions or comments. John and Brian, thank you for the informative presentation and uh, for sharing your uh, detailed knowledge. We do have about uh, eight to 10 minutes for questions, and if you have one that you haven't already typed into the Q&A box, please feel free to do so. We'd like to get through as many of these questions as we can in the next few minutes. And uh, to enter a question, just type it in the Q&A box. Ladies and gentlemen, just hold on one moment, please. Uh, Gary, if uh, you could maybe adjust your audio. Okay, hold on one moment, please. Okay, we're going to start the Q&A portion here. Okay. Bear with us just one moment, please. Okay, will this work for other types of plating? Uh Certainly. Um, if you have the parameters that you um, need to put in, and that's going to be, you know, the cross-sectional data, the thickness, things like that, connectivity, um, there's all kinds of different plating examples that you could do with this. It's, it's not specific to the electrolytic nickel immersion gold, um, but it will be dependent on having good parameters, um, and that's something that with, uh, with good measurements, even if that's not widely available, should be something that you can, at least in a cursory fashion, uh, determine to move forward. Um, and that's, that's something that's a, that's a very good uh, research project as well, is just applying this technique to lots of uh, different types of uh, finishes, uh, and that's something we would be eager to explore in the future. Okay. Um, the metal profile is trapezoidal and not rectangular. Can this be modeled too? Certainly. Um, so one thing that I've, I've done with the model, uh, and we'll click through back to um, look at this cross section here. One thing that we've done is just assume uh, that this is going to be rectangular. Um, now, if we want to do something that's trapezoidal, uh, we can approximate that with different layers. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be a discretization, just like any in simulator uh, for any geometry would be. Uh, but essentially, what we would do is take the bottom layer of this and push it out to the edges of that trapezoidal um, cross section and then have layers above that getting narrower and narrower. So we've effectively modeled that arc. Um, and that's a good way to handle that, and that should be able to handle the 
a current which is definitely going to be pushed to those outer edges. Current tends to uh, like to flow through sharp things. Okay, great. Um, what was the actual sidewall profile in the measured lines that were compared to stimulation? Yeah, the uh, the surface that I measured, we did microsections, and that's actually how we get the most accurate uh, dimensions for the copper thickness, the substrate thickness, conductor width, and all that. And these particular circuits did have a trapezoidal effect, but it was very minimal. So it would, uh, it, from a cross-sectional view anyway, it would appear to be more rectangular than uh, trapezoidal. And I don't have numbers in front of me, to be, to be honest, to tell you what kind of differences there were. But I've looked at a lot of microsections, and these particular circuits, uh, we asked the fabricator to try to be careful about this as well, to make it as you know rectangular as possible and less trapezoidal. But uh, they they did have some trapezoidal effect, but it's pretty light, and unfortunately, I don't have any numbers to really give you for reference. Great, and I believe we have Gary back with us. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I just disappeared off the face of the earth. It seems like. <laughs> well, so, welcome back. Thank you. Let's uh, go to, I don't know how many questions you've got through, but um, one question, how does surface roughness affect these results? Does finish type improve or diminish the uh, surface roughness? I would say those are, are two independent things. Um, it's, uh, you, you've got the effect of the surface roughness, you've got the effect of the plating. Um, and, and that's the way we've developed these models is separate. If there's um, a tie in between them, um, that, that is something we'd be interested in exploring. Uh, I'm not sure if that's something that would have a huge effect on this because basically the way that we've done this has, has gotten good results. Um, but certainly as frequencies go up, we see more and more things matter. So that would be a good research project uh, uh, for future directions. Have you done experiments of bare copper versus corroded copper? Uh, I have in measurements, and uh, much to my surprise, I don't see much difference. And uh, I was kind of expecting to see big differences in insertion loss between circuits with corroded copper and bare copper. And just an example, what I did was I measured circuits when they were brand new and very clean copper, and then later uh, let them age, so to speak, measure them again when they're oxidized and corroded. And I really don't see a significant difference in insertion loss. And then I'd go through a chemical cleaning of that same circuit, clean up the copper, and try it again one from being pretty oxidized to no oxidization, and again, I didn't see much difference. So intuitively, I would assume there'd be some kind of difference that the, the copper oxides, I think, are less conductive and you'd have that edge effect, but in the testing I've done so far, and it hasn't been real methodical, to be honest. It's just me playing around with a few circuits I had. But from what little I've seen so far, I don't really see the impact. Okay. Does the uh, final plated finish have an impact on phase response? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, John mentioned earlier that there's, uh, there can be a magnetic effect. Um, so for this, we were specifically looking at loss. Um, there is going to be that, that magnetic effect, and that's something that can be modeled, and you can measure the phase response. Uh, we haven't done it today. Um, that is something that we would like to do in the future, though. All right. Does the, or did yeah. the uh, co-planer – I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, there, there should be an effect to phase, um, especially when you see the higher phosphorus content uh, in your nickel plating. That's that's where you're going to see the magnetic coming from, uh, is the high phosphorus content in that nickel phosphorus alloy. All right. Did the coplanar waveguide sonnet model use vias for the ground plane? Uh, great question. It, it sure did. Um, so when we see uh, this model here, um, we're connected to the box walls, which are ground um, along the sides. We're also connected to the bottom ground plane, uh, which is going to be these green vias here that go straight down. All right. Uh, question, uh, trying to confirm something, I think. So basically, uh, ENIG is less insertion loss than using bare copper. Is that correct? Uh, the opposite. It, when you add the energy plating, you're increasing your insertion loss. All right. And what is the effect of uh, the EPIG finish on insertion loss? EPIG. Any, any pig in 
Actually, EPIG, that's a good one because I know of that fish, but I haven't evaluated it yet. I've looked at any pig, but I haven't looked at EPIG. Uh, I haven't looked at that, to be honest. Okay. So a topic for a future seminar or webinar. Um, for measuring for measuring bear copper in strip line, how do you make the two ground planes common? Say that again, please. Uh, for measuring bare copper in strip line, the question is, how do you make the two ground planes common? Hmm. So in, in simulation, um, they're, they're going to be common just because you're going to use the sonnet box for a strip line configuration. Uh, for measurement, it would be dependent on you know how you've launched your signal uh, and the connector interface, things like that. Uh, the nice thing about strip line is that because it's going to be enclosed by the PCB, uh, you're probably not going to actually need a metal plating finish on it. So hopefully it wouldn't be a problem. All right. Unfortunately, I think we've run out of time for more questions. So I w again want to thank John Coonrod of Rogers and Brian Radio of Sonnet for today's webinar discussing the impact of final plated finishes on the insertion loss performance of high-frequency PCBs. This webinar has been recorded. It will be available to watch within about an hour, and you'll find it at the event section of the Microwave Journal website. If your colleagues would benefit from watching it who weren't able to see it today live, please let them know. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.